come in Jesus name. So a bit of a background to what we are in for. The Lord gave me a very specific message. Uh, so for those of you who know me, you know I've been a pastor in one of our leading uh, Pentecostal mission for um, close to 12 years, over a decade. And the Lord pulled me out and gave me this very specific message that he wants to get in the simplest form the message of eternal life through his body, the believers. So you are part to hear this simple message, which you know, and to also be ambassador to spread this simple message, because that's what the Lord wants. And so this simple message has been put in the form of a book titled, Who is a Christian? The Pathway to Eternal Life. And that's what we will be discussing. At the end, we will have a space for a question, clarification, contributions. And we will have this um, recorded. At the end also, uh, we will have the e-copy of this book shared to everyone is free. Uh, the Lord told me, make it free. Let it be shared all over the world so that people will read it and get the message. Um, and just as this book came out a few days ago, uh, Mrs. Comfort Ubonakwabio shared with me the testimony of two Iranian ladies who were seeking for eternal life. And Jesus visited them. And so that further confirmed to me that indeed this simple message will go far as we all become ambassadors sharing it. We may not know who needs it, but as we just give it out freely, it will bless uh, many lives. The story of those uh, two ladies was that as they continued to seek, at least one of them said, she picked up a small book. That's how she described it, a small book. That the person who gave it to her told her, as you read this book, don't read to the end because at the end, they put the message of how, how to become a Christian because as an Iranian woman, she was a Muslim, but she was seeking for the truth. And she said, as she started to read that message, uh, check up the name of these two ladies, uh, as I've forgotten them on top of my head now. As she started to read that book, it said, from the start, Jesus Christ took over. The Holy Ghost filled her, and she got to the end. When she got to the end, she said, nobody can stop me from getting this blessing. And she just went there, gave her heart to Jesus Christ, was filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's, those two ladies have been the two young women turning Iran for Christ. If you heard the story of two young ladies that were to be executed because they were preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, those are the two ladies I'm talking about. And of course, God miraculously delivered them because their work uh, still has value and time is on. So that's how we will run. Now let's get uh, into the meat of it. Um, so I'll make the presentation and we'll do interaction and then we will share how you will get the e-copy of the books, basically that. One more time, I welcome also. Let me start by making a very categorical statement that the greatest need of all humankind is eternal life. The greatest need of all humankind is eternal life. Whether one accepts it or not, whether one knows it or not, this is the greatest need of all humankind. And of course, that can be very easily proven. At the end of life, at the end of life, every human being knows that it is no longer money, it is no longer wealth, it is no longer power, it's not even uh, miracles that is important. But what is important at the end of life is 
what happens after one takes his last breath. The whole world is actually seeking for this truth. And that's why people go into all manner of things. Some talk about protecting themselves in different ways by seeking powers. And some talk about protecting themselves by seeking wealth, seeking fame, whatever. But one day will come that every human being will breathe the last breath. And that is the message of eternal life. So who is a Christian? Is to make clear to all human beings that the path to eternal life has been defined and has been made available to all human beings. Though many don't know. It's not a subject of argument, but it's a subject of seeking and proving that indeed this is the truth. And that's what we are here for. So the short conference, the short life conference is about that sure proof. As we know, sure life means proven, tested, something that is guaranteed life conference. So sure, uh, fire, eternal life conference is a platform that God has given to us to uh, encourage ourselves, educate ourselves, teach ourselves, share, and maintain this eternal life that God has given to us, and as well uh, be a platform to reach all others who are seeking for this blessing of God, the blessing of eternal life. So once again, I bring you greetings and peace of, our God, of, our, of God uh, in the name of Jesus. And I ask that we keep an open mind to this message, this message of eternal life. The scripture says, so it is not the will of God that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance and gain eternal life. As recorded in 2 Peter 2, 2 Peter 3 verse 9 rather. Uh, the emphasis there and gain eternal life is mine. So who is a Christian? Who is a Christian? Let's start by introduction. Every time I pose this question, I receive several um, responses in very varied forms. Some people will start by defining a Christian as one who is righteous. Oh, that's very good. Some will talk about the manifestation of miraculous power. Oh, that's uh, also wonderful. But as wonderful as those may be, they truly don't describe who a Christian is completely. Because the Bible makes it clear that there is only one simple definition of who is a Christian. A Christian is one who is Christ-like. A Christian is one who is Christ-like. That is one who is just like Jesus Christ. Not a copy, but similar in nature and in the image of Christ. The Bible affirms this, as you see in 2 Peter 1.4. There, the Bible says that we have received, we have become the part, we have received the nature, the divine nature. We have become partakers of the divine nature. In Romans chapter 8, verse 29, again, the scripture makes this clear. It says, Whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he, the son of God, emphasis mine, might be might be the firstborn among many brethren. Among many brethren. We are his brethren. The other point to make is that every time I pose this question as well, and then make this point that a Christian is one that is Christ-like, uh, people will ask, can somebody born of a woman be just like Christ. Perhaps this same question is going through your mind. And I want to answer it with emphatic yes. 
And indeed, this has always been God's intention to raise up sons and daughters to himself. And that is who a Christian is. So for you to understand what it really means to be a Christian, we have to understand who Jesus is. Paul, the apostle, taught this. The apostles of old, this was what they taught. Jesus Christ himself, throughout his earthly ministry, this was what he taught. So much so that in Luke chapter 24, when he wanted to leave after his resurrection and prior to ascension to heaven, this is what Jesus taught his disciples. He said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And we will go back into that, but let me not jump. So question is, can any human being born of a woman be like Christ? And I said emphatic, yes. So who is Jesus Christ? Who is Jesus Christ? Let's just take a little exploration of that and understand the point that we have made before, that a Christian is one that is Christ-like. That's not a game. All Christians know that. And maybe other outside don't know. But the question is, what does it mean to be Christ-like? And is it possible for a human being, born of a woman, to be just like Christ? And I have said to you emphatically, yes. And I've also said, indeed, that's what God has always intended. That was why God sent Jesus Christ to make all mankind, as many as will receive, accept, just like I said before, that the greatest need of man is eternal life, whether the person knows it or not, whether the person accepts it or not. God sent Jesus for this purpose. So who is Jesus? Because of time, I will just take a few scriptures and give a, a bit, a uh, few points. Jesus Christ himself, but let's start with what Jesus Christ himself said about himself. Because this same question was raised to him while he was here on earth, and he treated it. In Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 17, you will see that Jesus Christ himself addressed this question. There the disciples asked him, or there Jesus asked the disciples, rather. Jesus asked the disciples, who do men say that I am? They answered, some say John the Baptist, Elijah, and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He then asked them, who do you say that I am? This is what I love about Jesus. And this is what I love about the message of eternal life. It is personal. It is not what people say. And that's why we are here in this Surefire Life Conference. I've told you the full name of it is actually Surefire Eternal Life Conference. That everyone who joins this conference may know and gain eternal life for himself and also be able to share that so that whoever, as the scripture has provided, will believe will accept, will gain eternal life. So Jesus made it personal. He said, yes, my disciples, you have said what other people say I am. Now, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Notice that Simon Peter first addressed him by you are the Christ, you are Jesus Christ, if you want to call it in full. And you are the son of the living God. So by that he made clear that Jesus is the son of God. Jesus accepted and approve Peter's declaration and affirm that only God, the Heavenly Father, revealed this truth to him. 
till today there are many who are struggling to understand this truth. What does it mean? How can God have a son? Uh, because of time, I would have loved to digress because I had an encounter with a Muslim who asked me this question. How can God have a son? And as I always do, I ask the Holy Spirit, please, what answer do you have for him? And the Holy Spirit guided me and said, ask him, what does your Quran say about Jesus? You can't believe that that day a Muslim preached Jesus to me. He told me that the Quran says, Isa, whom we call Jesus, was born of a virgin by the Holy Spirit. And he lived a sinless life. And he will come again to judge the world. And I asked him, he was born of the Holy Spirit. He said, yes, the Holy Spirit of whom? He said, the Holy Spirit of God. And I said, so whose son is he? He said, the son of the Holy Spirit of God. I then asked him, I said, does that qualify him to be called the son of God? He said, yes. I said, is there any other human being you know or you have heard of that was born, the Holy Spirit comes, uh, uh, impregnated to just be raw, a woman to give birth? He said, no. I said, so that emphatically makes him the only son of God, conceived by the Holy Spirit. He said, yes. I said, you are very near the kingdom of God. Now go tell all your people who are arguing and worrying about this truth that Jesus Christ is the son of God. And he, he told me, I have never heard it this way. And I said, let's not even stop there. Let me ask you, you have Jesus in your Quran? He said, yes. You have the Holy Spirit in your Quran, he said, yes. And you have the Almighty God, the Father in your Quran, he said, yes. I said, so what is the quarrel? That's the subject for another day when we will be treating the subject on this platform. But let's move on. So clearly, Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus accepted that declaration. In, the Jews understood the gravity of this statement that Jesus is the son of God. You will see in the book of John chapter 10 verse 33, the expression of their understanding. Unfortunately, uh, many of us probably don't appreciate the gravity of what this means. In John 10 33, the Bible makes us understand that the Jews hearing this said to Jesus, you being a man, make yourself God. He only said he's the son of God. He didn't say he's God, but yet they understood what it meant. The same John chapter 5, verse 18, the Bible says, therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. So they understood that as the son of God, Jesus Christ has rights authority and power over all of God's creation. Every creation of God in heaven and on earth is subject to him, whether visible or invisible, whether living or non-living. In fact, Colossians 1, 15 and 17, Colossians 1, 15 to 17, it says he, Jesus Christ, that's my emphasis, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and him all things consist. Let me pause here and reconnect us. Remember, the point is that we, those who are Christians, are like Christ and have received similar nature as Jesus Christ. So as you are hearing who Jesus is, understand, and I'm, hope, I'm believing God that your understanding of who you are, if you are a Christian, or if you are not yet, you will become one and you will understand who you are, will shift. 
Let me throw this in. Uh, there's so much to, 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 to bring in. You see, I, I found out that when Christians read the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, uh, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they tend to forget the setting in that space. While principles apply, while scriptures are valid, but the setting in that place was a setting of Jesus Christ giving message to people who were not yet Christians. Indeed, I also find out that most times we make the mistake of mixing disciples and Christians. Let me make again another categorical point here. That all Christians are disciples of Jesus Christ, but not all disciples of Jesus Christ are Christians. Let me repeat that. All Christians are disciples of Jesus Christ, but not all disciples are Christians. Uh, but not all disciples of Jesus Christ are Christians. And you will see the difference. So when you read the Synoptic Gospels, from today, understand the setting that it was a message of truth, valid message indeed, but spoken to at best disciples and the Jews, not Christians. It was that message then that the Christians are to take to live on. Because as you would see, that is only from Acts that Christians actually happen. But let me not jump the gun. So Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The Father himself affirmed this in Matthew chapter 3, verse 16 to 17 during the baptism of Jesus Christ. When he came out of the water, the Bible says the heaven opens and God spoke from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So just like Jesus was born of the Holy Spirit, God wants to make many sons and daughters for himself by giving them a new birth through his Holy Spirit. As recorded in John chapter 1, 12 to 13, John chapter 1, 12 to 13, I believe many of us knows that. He said, but as many as received him to them, he gave the, the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. If you look at Luke chapter 1, verse 35, Luke chapter 1, verse 35, you see this truth again, very clear. The angel Gabriel revealed this truth about Jesus Christ as the son of God during the conception and the birth of Jesus that I just told the story before. Recall the angel spoke to Mary and said, you will conceive and will bring forth a son. And Mary said, how can this be? Seeing I know not a man. And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also, that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Jesus Christ became the Son of God in the flesh by the Holy Spirit of God. That is the same Holy Spirit that Jesus promised that God will give to everyone who believes in him. It is only those who have the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, that are the children of God, just like Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 14, Romans 8, 14 and 16 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons and daughters of God. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Brothers and sisters, friends, beloved children of God, this is what it means to be like Christ or to be a Christian. It means to be born by the Holy Spirit of God. It is only possible to be a Christian by being born of the Holy Spirit. 
There is no other way. There is no works. There is no miracles. There is nothing else that qualifies anybody on earth to be a Christian other than being born by the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, as we have just quoted, if anyone have not the Spirit of God, he is none of his. If anyone has not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. That's Romans chapter 8, verse 9. Romans chapter 8, verse 9. This Holy Spirit is the one that nobody can fake. No one can fake this one. So God has made it so. No one may perform miracles, as I said, or even look so pious, so righteous, yet may not be a Christian if that person does not have the Spirit of God. No wonder Jesus said, Many will come saying, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Yes, the only identity of a Christian is the Holy Spirit of God. So question is, how can one then become a Christian? How can one become a Christian? I want to give us the model that God taught me, and I believe it will be simple enough for everybody to follow and to be able to teach others. It's nothing new. Of course, the whole scripture is not new. And this model, I call it BRRBL. BRRBL. I, I wish we could open the line so everybody can echo after me, but don't worry about opening the line. Just echo it where you are. B R R B L. Let's say that together. B R R B L. It means believe, repent, receive, become, and live. Believe God and His Son Jesus Christ. Repent of sin. Receive the Holy Spirit, which is what makes anyone be a Christian and become a child of God, a son of God, a daughter of God. Receive the Holy Spirit and become a son and daughter of God. Then live by faith and love in accordance and obedience to the word of God till you translate this world and continue to enjoy eternal life, which God has provided for you as his son or daughter. This is the simple model how to become a Christian. The challenge with many have been this matter of receiving the Holy Spirit. Oh, we have been told we ought to fast for 14 days or 21 days. Oh, we ought to fast for one year to receive anointing. Oh, we ought to go to a big man of God. Brothers and sisters, friends, your father in heaven loves you more than that. God is more willing to give you the Holy Spirit, to give me the Holy Spirit, than we are even willing to give egg to our children. And of course, you see that in the Bible. Luke chapter 11, verse 13. Luke chapter 11, verse 13. There the Bible says, is anyone, would any one of you, if your child asks you for egg, would you give him a serpent? Or if he asks you for bread, would you give him stone? In no particular order, I believe you're familiar with that scripture because of time. Then he went further to say, if you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more is your father in heaven willing to give the Holy Spirit to those who ask 
of him. Luke chapter 11, verse 13. We can actually read it all the way from 11 to 13. So this is the point. Beloved brothers and sisters, friends, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has made the way. He has paid the price. This we all know through our Christianity. It is bringing this to life and to everyday living that has been the challenge. His blood has purchased us and any human being that comes to him. God has promised. He said, whoever comes to God through Jesus Christ, God said, I will forgive. If you know the nature of God, that God is faithful, if you know the character of God, that heaven and earth shall pass away, but not a jot of his word will fail then you will take the word that God has spoken. And that's what it is. When you come to God, when we come to God, when we come to God and say, forgive me my sins. I accept Jesus Christ, your son. I repent of my sin. God accepts it. God forgives. That's the truth. It doesn't matter what the sin was. It doesn't matter what the life was. Paul the Apostle is a clear example. The persecutor of the church of Jesus Christ. The killer of Christians. Yet, when he repented, God accepted him. He does the same for all mankind. So that's what the steps are. So number one, as we said, you believe. Jesus Christ is the son of God. Who died for your sins, for my sins, for the sins of all mankind. Number two, you must repent and forsake all sins. Ask God for forgiveness of your sins. Number three is the crux of the matter. You must ask God to give you the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus and receive him by faith. It is by faith we receive the Holy Spirit. It's God that gives the Holy Spirit. Is not by the power or, a, or anointing of any human being. It is God that gives the Holy Spirit. The problem is many of us have received him, the Holy Spirit, and we are doing nothing with it, and we don't even know about it. Because we have been taught to fast for three weeks and have a sensation and see something. No, that is not what it is. It is by faith. Hey, I am not saying fasting is not good. Fasting has its own place, please. But the Holy Spirit is received by faith. Just the same faith that you exercise to receive salvation and repent from sin and came out of sin is the same faith you exercise to receive the Holy Spirit and manifest the Holy Spirit. So that model, believe, repent, Receive the Holy Spirit. And when you have received the Holy Spirit, walk by that faith and love. Know that you have become. It is the Holy Spirit that makes you become a son of God. It is the Holy Spirit that makes me become a child of God, a daughter of God. So know that you have become a child of God. If you walk by faith and love, with that consciousness that God is faithful, I have asked God for the Holy Spirit. I've repented of my sins. I've asked God for forgiveness. I've asked for the Holy Spirit. I have received him by faith. And you continue to walk in love. The Holy Spirit will do four primary things, much more than that, but let's quantify these four primary things in your life. As you continue to live in that consciousness, walking by faith and love, and allow the Holy Spirit to manifest the life of God in you, just like he did in Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit will manifest gifts. This gift that we have been pursuing, the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is the power of God. And he will manifest the fruits of the Holy Spirit, which is the righteousness of God. That nature, divine nature, will produce the power of God. It's in you. It will produce the righteousness of God. It's in you. 
The Holy Spirit will also drive you in the ministry. The ministry is acceptable services to God. And it will drive you in the area of fellowship, which is your personal communion, your personal relationship and fellowship with God. This the Holy Spirit will help you to do. As you continue to live that life, my brothers and sisters, eternal life is guaranteed for you. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 27 to 28, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Yes, no devil nor power of sin or of this world can snatch you out of the hand of Jesus when you have become a daughter, a son of God by the Holy Spirit. That anointing, that spirit of God will keep you. So why is it important to become a Christian? This is the conclusion. You see, there are several benefits of being a Christian, both in this life and hereafter. The Bible is replete of God's blessings and provisions for those who truly serve him through Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Apart from all the benefits of joy, peace, and the love of God one enjoys in this world, the privilege to be reconciled to God as son or daughter of God is such a profound experience. God has put a longing and emptiness or a void in human beings that nothing else can satisfy except God himself. Jesus Christ declared, I am the way, the truth, and the life, which we all have heard, or if you are new to it, that's what Jesus has declared about himself. And he said, no man can come to the Father except by me. So the true fulfillment and satisfaction in life comes only through Jesus Christ. And that comes through being a Christian. That is like Christ, as we have just discussed. More importantly, Jesus Christ is coming again. This is it. To judge the world. And he has given and guaranteed eternal life to all who believe in him. He said, this is eternal life. That they may know you and uh, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. John chapter 17 verse 3. John chapter 17 verse 3. In 1 John chapter 5 verse 11, this is further emphasized. He says, this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. He that has the Son has life. He that has not the Son of God has no life. Brethren, at the end of life for any man, and by the way, we should remember that we live with the end every day. Any day can be the end of somebody. It can be your end today, it can be my end today. And that's the joy. That's what we're talking about here, eternal life. When it comes to the end of life. Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 to 46, records an interesting uh, revelation that Jesus gave to all mankind. He said, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. The account concludes that Jesus will say to the sheep, who are the righteous? That is those who receive Jesus, cleansed by his blood and, and transformed by the Holy Spirit. Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. And he will also say to the goats, who are the unrighteous, those who did not receive Jesus, depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So a Christian enjoys the benefit of eternal life which is the greatest reward of all. As I said before, the greatest need of man is eternal life. And by becoming a Christian, that is one who is like Christ, one who has been transformed by the Holy Spirit. One ends eternal life. This is the pathway to eternal life. There are many more things to say, but because of time, we will draw it here.
Let me summarize. Very simple. To become a Christian, a simple model is B R R V L. Belief. Repent. Receive the Holy Spirit. Become a son, a daughter of God. And live by faith and love till you translate into eternity. A Christian is a unique creature of God. And there is no other creature of God like a Christian. No one is born naturally a Christian. But only the one God creates. God has recreated by his Holy Spirit. Is the one that is a Christian. God bless you. Thank you for listening to this message. We will open the line now and take comments, questions for the few minutes we have before we pray. And if there is anyone online here who want to surrender his life or her life to Jesus, as we have said, at the end of that prayer, just believe we will pray for you as well. Thank you. Mrs. Bamidele, the broad delight. God bless you, sir. I really enjoyed the message. God bless you, sir. Not a question, sir. Thank you. Thank you, madam. We heard you. Thank you, <laughs> Mrs. Bamidele. Oh, I can see you. Thank yes, you. Sir. God, bless Thank you sir. God bless you. God bless you. Okay, somebody raise hand. Comfort, raise hand. So please, comfort, go ahead. I will mute while you. Thank you so much. Uh, asking question, but to reaffirm what you have said so clearly, how we can become a Christian. We do understand the problem Christianity are facing now, but with this clear message from you, I think we are very happy that God's spirit is still in operation, even now. And people like you will help in spreading this message. And we will join you with God's spirit on our side to let everyone know that salvation comes to every one of us through Jesus Christ, our Lord, which you have clearly said. That was the reason the Father sent him. The Father sent him so that he can reconcile us to the Father. And that is what is required of us as Christians. Thank you for making this clear, clearer than anybody will be confused not to hear. Thank you so much. Keep on the good work. May the Spirit of God continue to guide you. Amen. Life. Thank you very much. Leo, Leo, please go ahead. Leo, go ahead. Um, everybody, please bear, bear with us. It's important uh, we do what is... Okay. Um, good morning again, Pastor Godwin. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for this wonderful presentation well put together. We, we've had cause to, to um, differentiate between who a Christian is and who a born again is. And you have spoken extensively on who a Christian is, and you've been able to give us another dimension and another light into who a Christian is. But I would like to find out what is the main difference between a Christian and a born again, if there's any difference at all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Brother Liu, I, 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 I love that question indeed. I think sometimes it's a mixture of terminology that creates problems. Um, so as we've clearly said, a Christian is one that is like Christ. And that's what it means. In fact, Let's remember that it was in Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11, verse 26, that the, Christ, the believers, the disciples of Jesus Christ, 
in Antioch were first called Christians. Acts chapter 11, verse 26. There the Bible says, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. And what really happened that made these Gentile people who were worshiping other gods see people who were disciples of Jesus Christ and then they suddenly said, these ones are like Christ. They are Christians. That's how the name Christians came about. What happened to those people? It was a transformation by the Spirit of God. If you go to the genesis of that story, it started with the story of Cornelius in that Acts chapter 10. And that same story was recapped in Acts chapter 11. And then it continued like that. That the people of Caesarea, which is the region where Antioch was as well, were transformed by the Holy Spirit. Now, if you bring that together with John chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, the Bible says of Jesus Christ, he came to his own and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the children of God. And then you play that against the popular John chapter 3, which is where your question is coming from. The born again statement. You see that it is all about being born of the spirit of God. As I made a statement here that nobody is a Christian except that person has been recreated by God. Except the person has been recreated by God. So, born again, as in John chapter 3, 3 to 5 and 7, you would see there, it says, except a man be born of the water, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Except a man be born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. If you want to make a distinction by that scripture, then you would say, born again, somebody comes into the kingdom. A Christian is then one who has received the spirit and therefore is ready to enter and therefore has entered, in fact, into the kingdom of God. However, the truth is, this making this distinction doesn't, does not really exist. That distinction does not exist. It can be made logically from that scripture. But the truth is, born again, in the true sense of it, ought to be born by the Spirit of God. That's the only way one is born again, is by the Spirit of God. So that would make a Christian to be one who is born again by the Spirit of God. I want to qualify in case it is possible for somebody to be born again without the Spirit of God. I doubt that, but this is what the Bible provides. So logically from John chapter 3, verses 3 to 7, you can make a distinction. However, the truth is, like you've seen in John chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, Except, I mean, um, we are born of the spirit, not of flesh, not of blood. That is who a Christian is. And that's what, let me use the word, born again ought to be. Thank you, uh, Brother Liu. I hope this has addressed uh, the point you raised. Let us pray. Please talk to God on your own. As I challenged us that God is more willing to give his Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 11, verse 13. To anyone who asks of him that we are willing to give bread to our children. So when you ask God, just believe. God is not stingy at all. God is loving. God is kind. God is caring. God is faithful. So just, just talk to your father. He is your father. He is your creator. He didn't create you for you to perish, but he has made the way. It's like somebody setting exam for you, giving you the marking scheme, and giving you everything 
that will come out in that exam and say, read. And then you refuse to read what he has given you. That's how it is. God wants us all to be saved and he has given us the means to end eternal life through Jesus Christ, his son, and by the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ came to this world. He died. He resurrected from dead. He ascended to heaven and he is now seated at the right hand of God, having all power, all authority, all dominion over all creations of God in heaven and on earth. And when we come to him, we are lifted to sit with him as a son of God, as a daughter of God, in that power, in that authority, in that dominion, to live. Many have only tried to use this in walking miracles and forget that it is a whole life. Living is the point. It is living, 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 living for God, living to fulfill his will and his purpose. Please talk to God in your way and we'll just round off now. In Jesus' name. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for teaching us your word. We thank you, Holy Spirit of God, the teacher, the one whom God has sent through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the comforter, to be with us, to guide us, to teach us the truth of God. We thank you, Lord Jesus, our Savior and our Redeemer for all you have done for us. Thank you for saving our souls. Thank you for washing us and cleansing us with your precious blood and reconciling us unto your Father and your God. You are the ruler over the kings of the earth. That's what the scripture says in Revelation chapter 1 verse 5. Now we hand over ourselves to you. And I pray, Lord, for your children who have heard this word, that you grant unto everyone now eternal life. By your spirit, let everyone hearing your word this moment become transformed. You have said, he that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. And so, everyone who has repented before you, almighty God, I thank you because you have already accepted and have forgiven them. Because you're faithful. Because you've said so. Thank you for forgiving us all our sins, all our iniquities, all our transgressions and our errors and mistakes. And now, Lord, I pray, breathe upon us afresh. Holy Spirit of God, in the name of Jesus, fill us all and give all of us the grace and the strength to live the way God expects us to live, to enjoy eternal life here in this world and at the end of our days in this world, to continue to enjoy in your presence throughout eternity. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen.